What's up, y'all? Casey Smith, Tyler Jones, and we are hunting with Giannis Patelis down here in Texas. We've been chasing around some axis deer and some pigs with archery equipment. And that's what we're going to talk about today is particularly our arrow and broadhead setups and what has led us to our current choices. We're going to go through some of the follies, some of the successes, and some of the things that have impacted our decisions throughout the years to make us land where we have. So, Giannis, you have had, you have a very interesting setup, in my opinion. Really? It looks really nice. Yeah. It's interesting? Yeah, it is. So it's especially so plain looking. Well, this one, I think, and we'll, we'll get into that, right? But um, I'm sure that you probably started with something a lot different than what you currently shoot, right? So, if you can draw back, what year did you start bow hunting? Um, I probably, I hunted a little bit in high school and that would have been like 93, 94 ish, mm -hmm. but I never, I never killed a deer back mm -hmm. then in Michigan. Um, I could not tell you what broadhead. I might've been out there <laughs> hunting with field points for all I know. I honestly do not know. Yeah. But, uh, when I started bow hunting again around 2001, I was hunting with a recurve. And so you decided that you were going to just go straight trad bow. You know, for like your reintroduction to archery. Sometimes that <clears throat> we can all be swayed by you know who other people around mm. us, and it just so happened that everybody in the crew that I ran with yeah. all shot trad, and gotcha. uh, yeah, you know, yeah. wheels were for bicycles or mm -hmm. whatever. I can't remember what they all. Ryan said. Callahan's that cool that you were just like, yeah. Yes, so this was a long know? time before Ryan <laughs> Ryan Callahan. But anyways. Um, so yeah, so I shot a recurve for a while, and um, I don't, you know I think that back then my broadhead of choice was probably a Zwicky or a Magnus Stinger. Mm -hmm. I think were the two that I was rocking. Mm -hmm. What do you think that setup weight? <sighs> Man, I was probably in the 500 to 550 mm -hmm. realm, which is but kinda... like all trad guys yeah. shoot heavy arrows, right? Mm -hmm. Because your bow is slower, so you need more weight for the penetration. I think yeah. is the common belief right mm -hmm. yeah that's that's the tail of, of the tape there did you have traditional wooden arrows or were you shooting aluminum shafts you know a, a good buddy of mine uh james miller owns um custom uh what's the heck the name of his company right now it's gonna escape me Sorry, Casey. <laughs> uh, I'm just waiting on you to point it at Tyler too. You know, like I, I get no. the I get he, the sharpie. He, he also he owns a, a tile company too that's custom tile crafting in Eagle, Colorado. And now, what is the name of his aerial business? Anyways, if you look up James Miller Custom Arrows Eagle, Colorado, you'll find mm -hmm. him. But he makes a compressed tapered wooden shaft. Oh, really? Which and it's um, footed, so mm -hmm. he does footings on it to get. FOC and mm -hmm. they're works of art. Like That's when cool. you get a set, you don't really want to go home mm -hmm. with them because they're so pretty. So I did shoot some of his, but I did realize that it was in my head. I couldn't get away from the fact that I felt like there was something more consistent. And so when I shot a you know 12 inch group at 20 yards, I didn't know was it all me? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the wooden arrows. And so sure. then I started shooting the uh, the gold tips. Gotcha. So Tyler. You did not start out with traditional equipment, from what I understand. Nope. Right? So tell me a little bit about your early bowing. My early bowing was done usually with a hand-me-down. Mm -hmm. So the fir first, they did. my dad did buy me a bow that was like a youth that mm -hmm. pulled 45 pounds. I happened to break my arm in a football game in seventh grade, and I continued to play the rest of the season because my dad <laughs> told me I needed to, and I wasn't really hurt, but I couldn't pull my bow back by the end of the season. And then he was like, oh, we might should get some x-rays on this thing. That bow almost, I don't know if I ever even shot at an animal with it. Mm -hmm. And so I went into the, essentially, the Matthews hand-me-down loop that was my dad's mm -hmm. hand-me-down bow always. And that's when I, sh I shot Matthews for forever, mm -hmm. and they were always older bows. Mm -hmm. um, but I pretty much... Whenever I started actually hunting deer uh, with a bow, I was 16, I believe, and uh, maybe 17, and I was pulling 70 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm shooting whatever arrows my dad had put in my case. Mm -hmm. So gold tip, carbon, exp uh, carbon express arrows, mm -hmm. probably somewhere like total arrow weight. I had 100 grain heads, and I was probably in the arrow weights were probably in the mid 400s or something mm -hmm. like that maybe so that's kind of what i started with yeah sure i started with a hand-me-down as well well first i did buy or my dad bought me a pawn shop bow 
that I don't even know what the brand was. You know, it didn't. It was unlabeled, mm -hmm. right? And that was really kind of to get in the yard and just strengthen the muscles and kind of do that kind of stuff. And a bunch of aluminum air, aluminum eras. And then I got a hand-me-down PSC Fireflight from my dad, which if you were around in the mid '90s, like that was that was the ticket back then, right? And so um, that was pretty cool. Killed my first buck with that, shooting aluminum eras. Uh, but then once I got kind of to making my own decisions, I got a pseudo hand-me-down Matthews Adrenaline, which is one of the greatest bows ever made, in my opinion. It's a solo can, bad to the bone, right? And I went <clears throat> to the bow shop, like many of us do, and not to discredit the work that guys at bow shops do, because uh, our bow shop's awesome, love those guys. But um, at that point in time, the thought was, 420 450 grains something like that shooting real fast and you put a mechanical on the end of it and they're gonna go down right so that's kind of where i what went what year was that roughly? um that would have been uh once i did that what that was 2011 whenever i okay made that move yeah so, so that might even been on the tail end of the ultra fast super lightweight arrow but potentially movement. But in Texas, we adapt or we adopt things a little later than okay. other people do, you know. So, and, and I don't, I don't know if I would even say that 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 is even a movement. I we think just that, got mullets. Yes, yeah, that's right. In Texas, or skullets. I'm not gonna take my hat off for that. <laughs> but um, I think that um, you just have subsects within archery, and I think that there's still, especially in the South for whitetail deer hunters, that's the standard go-to setup. Still, mm -hmm. like I don't, I don't think that like. I think that the movement that you're speaking of towards heavier arrows is a little bit No, more. no, no. I'm speaking of the movement to lighter arrows oh. that happened like in the early 2000s. Oh, yeah, like with the overdraws and all that stuff. Well, sure, yeah. That, like, I thought you were implying that that movement ended. No, 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 no. Uh, it might have. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, I think it's just from what we're all of us sitting here mm -hmm. no one's shooting a super That's fast right. light arrow anymore mm -hmm. so if if we're True. if we're any sign of that but mm -hmm. yeah don't let yeah. me get you off track no it's okay <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's kind of a point important thing to kind of address is that like there's um archery is very subjective right True. and it, i mean it's it's evident just from bows i will shoot one bow better than you will shoot that bow and then you will have a different draw length than me. You, how long is your draw length? 29 and a half. Okay, so you, you don't have a super long draw length, but it's longer than mine. I'm 28, which is very average. A lot of guys shoot 28s. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of guys shoot hand-me-downs, and whatever it is, you shoot. You shot a 28 for a very long time. My dad is a 28, mm -hmm. and I shot a 28 because I shot a hand-me-down. Um, I shot a 28 for forever. Mm -hmm. I was literally in my 30s before they figured out I was a 29. And so I've only been shooting a 29 for a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, Killed so, a lot of stuff in 28. Yeah, <laughs> I have, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and always, you know, I started out with that lighter arrow, but I, mm -hmm. we shot um, NAP Spitfire, mm -hmm. 100 grain broadheads. That was like, I shot, I've shot a few rages that were similar to that same style, the front deploy, you know, mechanical. And um, killed a lot of stuff with them, you know. Um, yeah. But you kind of start... What do they call it red pill? You get a yeah, of, let's go. Yeah, you get a little extra information. What, uh, and you can't go back, you know. What red pilled you to change into something different? Um, you. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 know we you had you had kind of I don't know how you did this so maybe you should talk about where you dove off into okay and found out about heavier arrow that's, setups because that kind of led. That's me. a great point because it was like you're like six months after me on that. Um, I. Decided I wanted a heavier air setup, so I kind of did my own research into that and settled on those Eastern Axes, which I think you shoot some of those now. What, yeah. Sorry, but tell us what made that decision. Um, I was influenced, I think, by either social media or TV culture or something. But not what you were seeing in the field with for yourself. Mm -mm. I killed I killed the Taurus stuff back whenever I had light arrows. Um, I, in fact, I can't really think of a time that. Uh, the super light thing hurt me then. I have another story later that we'll talk about of recent events with the light arrow. Um, but I think I was just, um, well, I'll tell you this. I shot an elk with super light arrows and rage broadheads and uh, had a very uh, blessed uh, <laughs> hit that I just got away with something. 
Right. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to be serious about elk hunting, like, I don't need to go to the woods with an arrow setup that's made for thin-skinned Texas whitetail. You know, I, that, and that was kind of where I was headed with that. Um, and that still ended up not being heavy enough for what I wanted to do. And I, I learned, too, that the heavier my arrow was, the more stable I, my arrow flight was, and the better control I had with fixed blade broadheads. Uh, because I kind of, let's see, 2018 mm -hmm. is what kind of made me want to transition into something different. Yep. Uh, Tyler and I were hunting on the ground in Kansas. We were rattling a buck from like 300 yards away, and I'm shooting a 440 grain arrow with front or rear deploy rage broadhead on it. And I shoot at this deer on the ground at 35 yards, and my arrow hits a piece of switchgrass. I mean, it is not your standard deflection, but sure enough, I mean, I think that broadhead probably deployed, and that arrow just went to just tumbling. And at that point in time, I was like, ah, if we're gonna hunt deer on the ground, I need to do something different. And then I went down the rabbit hole mm. and actually bought uh, a brand of arrow called Day Six Arrows, which you assemble yourself at home. You know, kind of like a, what you might call like, a, I don't know, is, it, is elite the word? Or what's the, what's the word for like top tier type of, of setup, upper right? Upper echelon. Yeah, upper echelon. They're expensive. Premium. You know? Premium. Premium, that's all I'm going for there. Yeah, and um, and wanted to do a fixed blade, cut on contact, broadhead. Uh, became friends with the guy who owned that company and talked through a lot of stuff and ended up settling on 587 grains um, because that's what fit my bow the best. And, you shot 125 heads? Uh, 125 heads, a uh, little bit wider with a bleeder. And I, I still really like that setup. I uh, killed one deer with it. Um, and uh, actually, um, you know, still had some, some headaches through it. But the same year, uh, shortly after I switched to it, we went on an elk hunt, and then I kind of talked you into it because you were going, you drew an Iowa tag that year. You're going to go hunt Illinois, big bodied whitetails. We're going back to Kansas. So I was like, hey, maybe you, something you should consider, you know, because you killed a really awesome buck in. 2017 with the light arrow three blade setup mm -hmm. but uh you didn't get a pass through and i was like hey uh pass throughs are it man because mm -hmm. with a pass through you get better blood trails like almost i would almost say that's like a rule mm -hmm. uh is that uh if you have two holes it's better than one uh, especially from a tree stand because oftentimes your second hole is on the lower half of the animal mm -hmm. uh, whereas your first hole may or may not be yeah um so that kind of leads you into yeah how you change so 19 to 20 i shoot a probably 550 ish grain arrow because you shot 100 grain broadheads shot 100 grain broadheads and the two blade two blade cut on co contact with bleeders and um i is pretty similar setup to your stasic mm -hmm. stuff um and i shot in 19 i shot a couple bucks in 20 i shot five bucks with that setup and I smoked everything. I mean, everything I shot, I killed. Uh, but I started to find out that even though I was I was putting two holes in them, mm -hmm. that a two blade I did not think was giving me good blood trails mm -hmm. at all. And um, I think a lot of times that wound closes up, and for whatever reason, you're just not getting much blood mm -hmm. leaking out. So I started going back to. Did that two blade have bleeders or no? It did. Yep. Um, but I just I know I had known that even with only one hole on several of my deer with a three blade mechanical big mechanical, I I, I knew I was getting still pretty better blood trails I felt like mm -hmm. so I, I kind of wanted to go back to something like that which I did in 21 and mm -hmm. still kind of shoot a similar setup to mm -hmm. that yeah. So what was there a event for you that led you to uh, you know I guess get away from the trad bow setup and and want to go to a wheeled bow and and shoot. Uh, you know, I don't use the word modern as a uh, diss towards the traditional, right? But this no, but more it's, modern. Yeah, it's yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah, a lot of technology here mm -hmm. sitting in my lap. It's a lot um, more than. Uh, well, what yeah, trail no, did you I, shoot? First it was of all. a Black Widow. Yeah, nice bow. Oh yeah, yeah. Still, still have it. Still have it. I bet. It has a lot of dust on it. Yeah. Sadly, <laughs> every now and then my kids and I will get our get the trad bows out and go chase some rabbits around and stuff. Fun. But yeah, it is. Um, no, I was telling uh, Greg earlier that I miss trad bow hunting because when you hike or when you leave like your stand and you go hiking back to camp or whatever, you would shoot 
you know, these prickly pears are awesome mm -hmm. for target practice. You know, you'd shoot the whole way back to camp and walk around with these things. Nobody ever does that. Yeah, you know, sure. you got to get back to camp. But uh, I'll say this, like, uh, what got me to switch from recurve to uh, a modern bow is that uh, I was sick of what letting stuff walk by at like 25 yards because mm -hmm. like my my max range was 20 mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'd spend a couple thousand bucks to go hunt Montana and mm -hmm. see three bulls and they were all <laughs> at 30 yards and I'd be like man if I had my uh, compound I'm pretty sure I would have shot yeah. you know yeah. were you a point on shooter or were you a gap shooter um instinctive instinctive yeah, yeah so 20 20 and in for sure yeah so I, yeah so i missed three bulls in montana mm. in, over the course of two years mm -hmm. and uh man it hurts yeah it hurts mm. so anyway that switched over um so at that point i hadn't killed anything with a bow so i didn't really have a reason to go light or heavy mm -hmm. but the reason i did make the decision to go heavier is because when i first started guiding elk in 99 Everybody shot a heavy aluminum arrow with mm -hmm. like a muzzy or a Zwicky on the front end of it because that's all there was. Mm -hmm. You know, there just wasn't a carbon arrow, just wasn't even a thing yet. Mm -hmm. But it was soon after that, like oh, one, two, three, when all of a sudden guys came in with bows that like we were used to watching the arrow hit the target. Mm -hmm. And now they would shoot, and you'd be like, where'd the arrow go? And they would just be sticking in the target. I mean, it was literally mm -hmm. that drastic of a change. And, of course, we all thought, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> and then within a couple of years, they'd be like, this is not great. Because yeah. a lot of elk would have, you know, arrows going in this far. Mm -hmm. And then you just watch them w walk away, and you would just know that there's no reason to even go look. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's why I ended up going heavy. So I guess the, the first rig that I shot at some elk and killed an elk with was a... Uh, Easton full metal jacket mm -hmm. uh, with a muzzy stinger, um, double bevel, mm -hmm. but single blade, no bleeders on it. And smoked her like a medium sized cow, quartered away, right through both shoulders, like amazing penetration, was busting ribs and bones going all the way out. And uh, found the arrow and thought, oh man, like in an hour, we're gonna go cut this elk up. 24 hours later, long story short, I find her and she had done like over a mile loop. And we mm -hmm. found, I found her just because I happened to be on a high point. I looked down and she had fallen into this beaver pond and I find her. It was cool because she was super cold because she was in this like That's 35 cool. degree yeah. water all night. Mm -hmm. And so the neck crops, you, everything was perfect in there. And so I was able to see that, yeah, I got this amazing penetration, but the lungs just had this, like you were talking about, this one single flat hole through there. And I think that because there wasn't another access to that cut, mm -hmm. it just, it sealed up and she was able to, she died, but she went a long ways. Mm -hmm. And had I not gotten lucky, I wouldn't have found her. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I think I switched over to slick tricks. Mm -hmm. uh, killed one elk, but also hit two elk that I didn't recover with mm -hmm. those. And at that point is when I started getting more into like researching it, reading Ed Ashby's stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you feel um, like that was broadhead failure or just the nature of a four blade broadhead? Man, or other it, factors? Other, uh, honestly, it might have been the FOC thing more yeah. than anything because mm -hmm. the arrow was heavy. It was mm -hmm. like a 525, 535, mm -hmm. you know, setup. Yeah. But, um, I mean, again, it's just those shots where you wouldn't change anything about it mm -hmm. except you go, man, why didn't I get the penetration sure. that I thought that I yeah. should have gotten? You and know, those uh, those Easton um, full metal jackets, uh, they're great eras, and I know a lot of people kill a lot of stuff with them, but people struggle to get good FOC and not go crazy heavy because mm -hmm. they have such high GPI. They're grains That's per right. inch. That's yeah. right. And at that time, I didn't really even think about FOC. I was sure. just like, oh, my total arrow weight's 535. Mm -hmm. I'm off to the woods. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's something that has, that has changed now in my setup. Gotcha. Okay, so let's transition to our current setup and tell me where you landed, why you're there, and if you you intend to do any tinkering from here on. Sure. Um, and I will say, man, uh, you know, my experiences are limited. I'm still like around a dozen animals shot with, uh -huh. with the bow. So it's a very small sample size of data that I So to help I you caveat from. that though, you got it elk for how many years? A dozen. A dozen years of guiding elk. And how many archery elk did you see shot? Oh man. You don't have to be exact. Yeah, sure. Top of my head, um, I don't know, 40. So you're drawn from a, a decent sample size, even yeah. though you've only, you said a dozen, right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so I went to a uh, 
I just started thinking about just the whole, um, cause I was seeing it amongst friends and stuff, people having not just not getting enough penetration, but overall broadhead and aerial failure mm-hmm. where something in this area was breaking mm-hmm. and maybe causing, you know, the, you know, not to not get the penetration, not kill the animal. And so I started really thinking about, well, I need this whole thing to be extremely like, you start thinking about you're shooting it at, you know, almost 300 feet a second mm-hmm. into a big animal, lots of bones and stuff. Like it needs to be pretty robust, mm-hmm. right? If you, if, in case something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I started talking to uh, Seth Poston over at uh, Sirius Archery, um, Troy Fowler of the Ranch Ferry, uh, and um, I, at first I ended up really heavy. I was at a 650 grain uh, setup. Mm. I think it was at that. I think that era was a uh, 300 spine. I was running 200 grain. Um, tough heads mm-hmm. and um, and at that I, weight you're back to instinctive shooting again right because you can only shoot 20 yards <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> um, you know I never within my effective range that I'm going to shoot at animals I yeah. never felt like that the pin gap mm-hmm. or too much arc was ever a thing with that arrow now, not to me. not to get you off track too far but were you shooting a uh, sliding sight at that point in time or are you shooting fixed sliding sliding yeah, yeah. so you didn't have to worry about too much gap on three or five pins because you could sl- slide like your two up and down. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Gotcha. Um, and again, I just, you know, I, you know, for an elk, I'm usually going to cap it at what, 50. Mm-hmm. And I usually don't end up just ha- getting shots like that. And mm-hmm. I realized hunting whitetails over the last five years that, like, I've yet to have an opportunity at a shot over 20 yards. Mm-hmm. Like, it just hasn't happened, mm-hmm. right? Um, so at that point... It just doesn't matter. Yeah, and, to me, and so what terrain do you usually hunt whitetails in? What area of the country? Uh, central Wisconsin, mm-hmm. very hilly country. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for whitetail country, it's mm-hmm. like two hundred feet elevation gain mm-hmm. and loss. You know, from the tops of the hills to the yeah. bottom of the hills. Mm-hmm. Timber, right? Yeah, all timber. Mm-hmm. Um, very little field edges hunt hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, all big timber. Mm-hmm. And so you actually, so you had that super heavy. But yeah, now so, you, so gone. with that super heavy, and, and I had good luck with that super heavy. Um, I killed a, uh, a my first white tail buck with it, and I killed uh, two elk, um, one with a great shot behind the shoulder and one with a shot that went literally up his rear end, mm. and, um, and, it, and it killed him. How um, far did it go into him? Um, basically the whole shaft. Like, mm-hmm. you could just see the so knock pierced the diaphragm. sticking out. Probably. You know... This is something that I'm not going to do anymore because sure. every animal that I kill the bow from here on out, I will necropsy and mm-hmm. so I could answer that question. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I actually made it. I don't think gotcha. that this is this wouldn't didn't take me to the diaphragm. Gotcha. I think I cut a major artery like right along the spine, mm-hmm. and and he bled out. That's how my first elk was too. You know, poor shot, but extremely lethal. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, that femoral artery. That femoral uh, artery does it to them. Or mine was the aorta, which was, you know, right along the inside of the spine, you know, up near the tenderloins. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the same one, I think. Yeah, I it goes in the same spot. But, yeah. So, it took a little while to die, but, yeah, I did yeah, it. That's the 650, and then you wanted to get away from that one. Well, I didn't really want to get away from it. It was working just fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, I get in, in my line of work, I get to talk to a lot of people mm-hmm. about this this stuff. And a fellow said, hey, I think I can get, get you an arrow that might fly a little bit better. I think it's going to give you the same penetration, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a little bit lighter. And so my buddy um, Kyle Davidson from Davidson Custom Aerials built me this one, which is an Easton Axis. And uh, it's a uh, 300 spine. Originally, he was only running 100 grain heads with, I think, like a 75 grain insert behind here. It came out to be about 500 grains, mm-hmm. which I do like because I decided to go pronghorn hunting mm-hmm. last year, and uh, it was nicer to have a little bit zippier arrow, mm-hmm. a little bit flatter shooting. Still didn't help me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't fast enough. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I still need something faster mm-hmm. for those pronghorn. But uh, anyway, so this arrow, I've shot it at a, a couple arrows at pronghorn and one at a whitetail. And um, unfortunately, I haven't killed anything with it yet. Mm-hmm. So hopefully that'll change maybe this week. tomorrow. Yeah, maybe tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so you have two arrow setups in your hand right now. Yeah. What's so this is one? the 500 grain setup that I was just telling you about, uh-huh. and then this is a uh, 600 grain setup. A um, little bit stiffer spine because there's more weight up front, so you got to mm-hmm. have a stiffer spine to mm-hmm. maintain good arrow flight. And uh, this one comes in at 600 grains, and uh, it'll, it's my elk arrow. 
Yeah. You killed anything with that? Yes, I killed a bull elk last year with it. Yeah, gotcha. And it was you. You were happy with the way it turned out. Yeah, it went. It was great. It went through rib on the entry, rib on the exit, and then it stuck right here in that knuckle mm -hmm. where the you know mm -hmm. lower half of the front leg meets the uh, scapula. And that's a single bevel. Single yeah. bevel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed a greater performance with single bevels as opposed to a you know what what people would just normally associate a broadhead being but it's called a double bevel that's right yeah yes i have you know i don't know there, i've watched i don't know five or six animals now die shooting mm -hmm. single bevels um but mostly what i see compared to just the double bevel is that upon entry instead of just having that same you know one slit across like you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. You, because as soon as it hits, it starts to rotate. Mm -hmm. Those single bevels, one push, you got force pushing one way and force pushing the other way. So it's actually rotating as it goes through the medium mm -hmm. that it goes into. And so in the hide, you just see sometimes what looks like an L or an S mm -hmm. cut. And I'm just imagining that as it keeps going, it's doing that as it goes through the tissues, mm -hmm. you know? So it's causing, I think, more damage mm -hmm. than if it just went straight through so if you look without. at surface area because there's rotation there's a greater so it would be like if you took a twizzler and unrolled it it would be longer mm -hmm. which would mean more area of cut yeah 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 mm -hmm. so i imagine it's doing more cutting but, i know that when i shoot my tar targets at home mm -hmm. foam targets the ones that have these bleeders on them don't rotate nearly as far because mm -hmm. as you pull them out backwards you know you're feeling the arrow rotate out of the target mm -hmm. The ones with the bleeders barely rotate, where the ones without bleeders, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a, you know, more than half a rotation, mm -hmm. more than nine, more than 180 degrees. Yeah. And so this one doesn't have bleeders. It's yeah. kind of more like in, what, like the tough head style or whatever. Yeah, I right? mean, all of them, I think now you can get with or without. Uh -huh. And you've done that because you're trying to really amp up the rotation. Yeah. yeah, I don't want anything in hindering the rotation mm -hmm. of that broadhead. Because gotcha. I think that's like the main thing about a single bevel. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, like, what's the big deal, Yeah, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they say single bevels. I've, I've gone through some scapulas on elk and deer now with a mm -hmm. single bevel. And there's a big, long crack. You know, sometimes the crack is eight, nine inches long. Mm -hmm. And the, the broadhead and the arrow have gone through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they said that supposedly they will split bone better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know if I have enough sample size to really say that I believe it or not, you know. Um, I know there's a lot of people that like them, and I'm glad you're shooting them. That means that we have, uh, we can discuss it, because I'm not shooting them, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, we, we kind of have ended up in different places. But, Tyler, why don't you tell me how you went from that really heavy setup that you had and wanted to go, uh, tell me how you ended up where you are. Right sure, now. yeah, this what I've got right here is what I kind of came up with uh, with a buddy of mine named Isaac Smith. No relation, right? Eh, somewhere. Somewhere. Down the line. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, he, he has an arrow company, and we end up um, shooting his arrows, and he talks me through essentially this setup, which is uh, not available anymore. It's called Vector ZMR. Uh, became Method at one point. Uh, but ZMR was their lighter offering, the HMR was the heavier. And the ZMR for me with a 29 inch draw, 125 head, ended up at 497. So right at 500 is what I always said. Uh, so pretty close there. And then um, this is actually a pretty well made front, front deployed mechanical um, and it's really big as you can probably see. I think it's a two and a half inch cut or something like that. What um, brand is that? It, what brand? It's a Grim Reaper. Yeah. Um, and got a pretty durable head right here. Um, fairly sharp, actually. I stuck one of these in my hand on accident one time. Uh, but You've done that with a couple different broadheads. I am, actually. <laughs> when, I, when I shot the fixed blades during 19 and 20, I couldn't get used to it, and I kept slicing my fingers, pulling them out of the quiver. Um, but anyway, this is what I got. It's a big wound channel. I like three, the three blade cut because it leaves these, these flaps that, you know, allow bullet to go in and out really, uh, really easily. 
So anyway, and this it's a it's a it's a pretty durable broadhead overall, but it is a mechanical, so there's failure points on it um, mm -hmm. that you don't see with a fixed blade. Um, and so I really try to stay away from the shoulder. Um, and then so I, I shot this setup in 2021, um, and I was really glad I wanted something. I wanted less pin gap because we hunt a lot of open country whitetails, and I feel like that um, that it's hard to range in that country because especially in spot and stalk situation you can hit grass real bad you can't get too high up or they're going to see you know so you got to range through grass it's really hard to get an accurate range and you do your best and sometimes you hit grass in front of them three or four yards and if you're shooting if you're shooting 45 yards and he's actually 49 that's a pretty big difference mm -hmm. you know at that distance i mean there's, there's a lot of drop that can happen there if i can interject there mm -hmm. it's worth doing the research with your own arrows and seeing how much your drop is. Set yeah. your target at 45, shoot it at 43, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, set your target at 43, you'll get what I'm trying sure. to say. Yeah, set it at 45, put your pin on 43, and see what happens if, mm -hmm. you, if you miss the yardage. Yeah. And, then, and see how much room for error you have there. That way you have a good idea. And it matters at different distances too. So like right. if you do it 20 versus 24, it's, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. But the difference in 54 and 56 is a lot for most people. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. So that's that's why I wanted a little bit lighter, flatter shooting setup. I wanted to get closer to my old arrow, but still have a little more weight. Uh, it's got a better FOC than my old arrow as well, um, which I don't know exactly what it is anymore. I used to know, but I know I know we wanted to be above 13. Mm -hmm. um, that was like our minimal number, and we got there. It's a four four fletch arrow as well. Those fletchings are a little so, smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you getting away with that, and what's the deal on that? Uh, how am I getting away with it? Yeah. Well, the FOC kind of helps, helps a lot that. of that. But, and I mean, you do you ever shoot fixed plates now? No, and so the reason I shoot a mechanical, a big reason, I like I like the cut that a mechanical gives me, um, and I don't hunt elk. I, I mean, I've been I've elk hunted twice. You would like to? I would love to. <laughs> As a Texas resident, those tags are hard to come by. So uh, I don't hunt elk. If I hunted elk, I would I would definitely do a different setup. I believe. Um, I did shoot a Neil guy with this setup, and it worked really well. Um, so, you know, maybe a, probably a little smaller than most elk, but still a big animal. Um, no, but I have known to be very, very tough. Yeah, they oh, for sure. I they believe are. It too. I do too. Um, so, anyway, another another reason that I shoot a mechanical instead of a fixed blade is because during the nineteen to twenty, I I was I didn't shoot any deer. I don't think over thirty that mm -hmm. year with that fixed blade setup because I couldn't, I couldn't group my arrows. It seemed like they were really inconsistent. And I think the reason, I think a big reason for me, and I, I don't know this, but I feel like I have a lot of torque in my grip because I have, I don't have opposable thumbs like most people. <laughs> uh, I actually cannot bend either one of my thumbs at this joint right here. Um, and, it, and it puts a lot of pressure on my shelf um, whenever, because my thumb won't just bend over and go down so this knuckle puts a lot of pressure on my shelf whenever i'm shooting and i just can't i just can't shoot a, a fixed blade very well i never mm -hmm. have been able to they just don't group well i can see them moving because of torque so the mechanical you mess really around you bare shaft tuning and all that and yeah it didn't work huh? um i mean i've done i do every time i take a new bow in i i shoot a bare shaft and try to get it to go through paper well and usually the the tech that's helping me is like yeah it's good enough you know um so I, I i do struggle with it for sure but i shot this out of this this a little slower bow this year um and then in 2022 the year we did buck truck i shot a 350 ibo bow and i didn't shoot it that well um i shot it pretty good but mm -hmm. I, sh I didn't shoot it as well as i shot this bow which is like a 333 or something like that it's a longer ata which you know gives me a lot of uh forgiveness i believe and mm -hmm. stability you know yeah. so yeah that's what i that's what i've come to what about you man you and i ha are kind of in similar places it might be because we spend a lot of time together <laughs> um we tend to think alike but i have a little bit of differences on things and, and i'm more of a tinkerer than you are mm. you, you um yeah at no fault because you kill stuff you would like for someone to be like hey this works that way you don't have to think about it and you yeah. can go kill things well and i would say that every deer that i've shot Everything, and I've, I don't know if I've hit one in, well, I hit one in the shoulder. Every year I've shot behind the shoulder with this setup, I've had two holes in mm -hmm. pretty much. And it's, 
Uh, it's not always that the arrow comes out the other side completely, but there's two holes in them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's worked really well. Even yeah. on big, big deer, it, it goes all the way through mm -hmm. with a five, with that big broadhead, but a 500 grain arrow at uh, out of a 29 inch draw. You have a kind of an infamous uh, shot at 50 yards at one of the biggest public land whitetails I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, shot that arrow set up at 50 yards mm -hmm. and uh, shot him in the heart and had, you had uh, heart around the hole all the way around. Yeah. So like just dead center punch. Yeah, there was margin yeah. around all the cut. Mm -hmm. It was the best and shot it's, ever it's, it's Ted Nugent's mystical flight of the arrow in the footage oh, too. Oh, for sure. It's, it's awesome. It's cool. Um, so a little bit different path still for me though. Uh, whenever I went down the heavy arrow road, my arrows are 587 grains. I think they're like 12% FOC just because you end up with that sometimes with uh, you know, GPI situations. Kind of like we were talking about with those uh, full metal jackets. It's hard to find an arrow that's spine heavy enough to get mm -hmm. up to those weights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you don't know, spine is about the deflection of an arrow or how much it bends under certain amounts of weight, right? And so like a 300 like bends less right than a 450. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what? that's a 200 right there, right? So uh, like 250, yeah. yeah. I don't remember how, how much the weight is, but essentially you would hang an arrow on two points of contact, put a weight in the middle, and how much it flexes is the spine. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you have to add more material to make something stiffer. That's kind of that's how things go oftentimes. Different materials will give you different results in that. But for me, 587, I loved the penetration I would get if I hit the animals where I wanted to. But at 587, I was to where my pin gap was big, to say the least. You know, I'm, I'm not a... Uh, a super big guy, 28 inch draw length, shooting 70 pounds out of most, because that's what most bows go to. And, and at that weight, um, I, I shot a deer high in the shoulder uh, in December in Kansas. And uh, it really upset me um, because I just thought I was gonna kill him. And I probably had the yardage off by like one inch and he might've dropped a little bit or whatever it may have been. But essentially, uh, you know, there's a lot of difference in 30 and 32 yards when you have that heavy of an arrow. And so I wanted to maybe scale it down a little bit. I don't know if I need, this is actually one of Tyler's ideas, I don't know if I need to bury my arrow six inches in the clay on the other side of the deer. Mm -hmm. I kind of just want to get through. And, and so long story short for me, somewhere between 500 and 535 is where I really like to be on an arrow. And I usually like that 525 to 535. But I'll experiment more down in those lower weights. Um, so the arrow setup that I have right now is a 500, I think it's 504. It's a four fletch. This is an Exodus arrow. Uh, and I also, I carry two different broadheads in my quiver usually. I'll always have, because I like fixed blades as well, but I just can't argue with the results of a big three blade mechanical. I mean, they kill things very well if you hit them where you should. And sometimes even if you hit them where you don't. And that's one of the things I like about a big mechanical is it gives you a, a large margin for error, right? I mean, as you were saying, this is practically like putting a line through something, you know, like it's, it's very large and you're making a big hole. And so if you were going to barely hit the lungs, if you hit the lungs with this, you essentially are getting deeper into them. And there's a particular deer that made me be this way about mechanical because I used to want to, I wanted fixed blades to be the answer mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, there was a few years where we didn't see eye to eye on That's right. Heads, yeah. And this actually is a different fixed blade than I thought was in here, but it doesn't really matter as long as you're, you're tuned well and, and you're not torquing your bow. But um, I shot a iron wheel wide with bleeders vented through a Kansas deer at like 14 yards and upon ne necropsy, had double lunged the deer. The deer was still alive four hours later and had to be finished off. He was on his feet not four hours later. It wasn't like he was like laid over, you mm -hmm. know, like it was like a terrible few hours <laughs> sitting here watching this deer on the plains walk around. Um, and so it was at that point, I was like, man, I just, I don't know if um, fixed blade is the answer. So. Now I carry both in my quiver. This is a three blade fixed. Um, there's a lot of broadheads that are, that are this style, like the Exodus broadheads. This is a method broadhead that's no longer in production, but I really like them. Um, 
And in certain situations, I'll still shoot this. A lot of times when I'm hunting pigs, I like to shoot this. If I'm hunting heavy cover, I like to shoot a fixed blade broadhead because of like that deflection thing that I talked about before uh, on that Kansas buck. I feel like you're going to get to push through some of that stuff. Now, I would never be a proponent for intentionally shooting through a mess, right? Like that's that's probably uh, to each his own. But in in my opinion, that's uh, inducing undue variables that you could just be patient. Yeah, I don't think there's there's no. It's been proven very well with rifles that there's no such thing as a brush buster. There's not a brush right, gun, rifle. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think the same goes for arrows. Yeah, in fact, you're you're talking a factor of ten slower, so uh, it's not gonna it's gonna actually probably be worse, right? Yeah. But a low-light but, situation, you don't always see every twig. I guarantee you, especially the briar country we yeah. hunt, you know, that stuff's hard to see. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where I have ended up. You know, these these here in particular are 500 grains. I kind of would like to be a little heavier than that, but I'm shooting these really good. And I think that um, shooting something good is more important than hitting a number uh, because numbers are arbitrary because, if the deer or the hog or the axis or the nil guy dies, that's the that's the end goal. And you want it to be quick, efficient, and clean, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, if your goal, like for instance, you know, I went down that path of wanting five, five, close to 600 grains. Well, if I'm hitting things high in the shoulder because my ranges are a little off or something like that, well, that's not actually achieving the goal of being an efficient bow hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why I've kind of landed in this spot. And it's mm -hmm. kind of a... It's like uh, I don't expect to always just have the same setup, you know. Mm -hmm. like I think there's always there's something about bow hunters in general that's like a kind of a constant want to tweak and get better mm -hmm. at those things. Um, and so I mean, in yeah. a few years we're all probably going to be shooting at something a little different. Oh, you know, side sure. trip for me. Um, this year I went on a really great elk hunt, uh, but while I was there I fell on a rock and messed my side up. So, uh, kind of like you referred to earlier, in my line of work, I have a couple bows around. Um, so I was like, oh, I killed deer, smoked them for a few years with, you know, a really light arrow set up. I have a turkey set up at home, 416 grains. I shoot really, really well. I'm going to see how I like that. And took that, arrow, that bow on a road trip and uh, had some pretty terrible results uh i shot a deer uh in the soft stuff double lung didn't get a pass through and um i shot it with a two blade mechanical um and that deer was alive 18 hours later i had to shoot it a few more times to get it to expire What's the total arrow weight 416 grains and so um so now you're back at 500. Now I'm back up. <laughs> I, I kind of, I actually had some conclusion as to like, okay, that's that's not really. Now it was great because I, my, I practically didn't need a 30 yard pin, you know, because mm -hmm. I had a 20 and a 40 set on my slider, because 30 was just 20, just a touch high, mm -hmm. you know. However, um, that's that, in my opinion isn't the most effective thing for me mm -hmm. in the white woods. So Giannis, if you were gonna I guess you're, you're in the middle of an experiment with the no bleeders. Do you have anything else that you're interested in playing around with that you might strap on before next deer season? Mm, no, I don't think so. I don't necessarily, I don't really want to be messing around too much. Mm -hmm. I'd like to land somewhere and, and be confident with it and really just expand my, you know, experiences and my mm -hmm. data set. Because, I mean, that's the, you know, one thing that stuck out with with your story is that you had one real bad experience with that single bevel and it mm -hmm. made you immediately switch oh, i didn't actually tell that on, on here we were talking about this the other day right so i shot a well, you did just you did say that that was a no that was a single that was a two blade mechanical oh you and i were discussing the other day which i should probably go ahead and say on here one of the reasons that i don't shoot single bevels anymore is because of a single experience i shot a hog through both front shoulders with a single bevel and uh had broadhead failure with that single bevel. It was a, uh, a Samurai, which is made by Grizzly Stick, I believe. And I, now I know they make great products, um, but in that instance, I uh, did what we would call a shish kebab on the, on the hog. I had a pass through, but it didn't go all the way through. So the hog ran off with my arrow. Arrow breaks pretty quickly because the shoulders are going back and forth. And I recover the arrow, but I don't recover the hog. Uh, 
okay blood trail, but not really what you'd want for an animal that you just go right through the vitals on. And uh, the broadhead had broken halfway down, like right at the tip of the ferrule. And mm. so I don't know w at what point in time, you know, at what point within the animal's body cavity that happened. So I quickly moved to something else. I don't, um, I, I'm not saying there's right or wrong on but this. But you had this story about the iron wheel wide mm -hmm. that didn't mm -hmm. that was a, that was a that was a double bevel okay yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but that caused you to go from that style of heavy mm -hmm. you know a, whether it was a double bevel or single bevel mm -hmm. but from that you know mm -hmm. single blade back over to mechanicals well i think that uh i'm not fully back over to mechanicals but i'll have both in my quiver mm -hmm. and in fact in that situation because i was he was bedded underneath a cedar tree and i didn't it was a very fast shot because I saw the deer. He was alert to us, and and I already had my bow drawn. It was, you know, kind of peek over a, a, a rim kind of thing. And uh, since it was so unknown, I might still go for a fixed blade. Mm -hmm. But because of the results of that, I decided that, hey, if I'm going to double lung something, I want it to die quickly. Yeah. Uh, that's why I at least shoot a lot of mechanicals. And, um, man, when you're crawling around on the ground... And you don't go to the bow shop very often. Him, Tyler and I both went to the bow shop the other day. And both of our bows were out by more than a half inch of spec. Ooh. Uh, yeah. And it's because pretty hard on equipment, you know. And that's not to say that you should be irresponsible and shoot things that don't work. But it is, it, it is something that I think everybody probably goes through a deer season. And they may or may not have time to go to the bow shop. I like that a little deer forgiveness season. in my that's right. setup. For yeah. Sure. A little forgiveness with, with the mechanical there. Mm. Um, so... As far as like things that I would like to mess around with, um, I'd like to shoot a really wide three blade fixed. I don't know who makes the widest three blade fixed, but I a vintage. I think that Mega Meat kind of. Well, that's that, a isn't it? that's a mechanical. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I want like a, a wide three blade blade fixed. I have like, heard the Mega Meats does yeah. really a really good. Our job. friend Mark Kenyon shoots those. Mm -hmm. uh, I think exclusively these days. He quit yeah. though. Did he? Yeah. Because he hit the shoulder last year and it didn't mm -hmm. go through. Oh, there you go. You know one thing that I am messing around with? I'm going to continue that? to mess around with. I've had great success so far. Mm -hmm. but I'm going to continue doing is purposely shooting deer in the shoulder with this setup. Mm -hmm. And hopefully continue to have the success that I've had. Gotcha. And you feel like um, there, as far as anatomically, there's a reason to be up in the shoulder. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I feel like that's the dead center of the vitals. Mm -hmm. Do you mean, uh, when you say in the shoulder, do you mean in the triangle? Is that what you mean by that? Like the vital V triangle? Yeah, so like, um, I don't know the name of the bones, right? But I do the know the Humerus scapula. is the one that comes humerus. up. Yeah, scapula. exactly. And then an imaginary line would come back down to the bottom of the humerus. Yeah, totally. And that's the, that's the golden triangle yeah. right there. Yeah. yeah, so I like to be, instead of going up the leg and kind of back on that mm -hmm. crease, I just go up the leg and go dead center. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind to be, if I'm three or four inches forward of that, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Tyler, any experiments for you? Um, I have been experimenting with my form. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. I just want I want to make the best shots possible, um, and I want to be very consistent. Mm -hmm. So, like I like my setup a lot, um, and I think that uh, like relaxing my left shoulder has mm -hmm. been really tough for me because I, I shot a 28 inch bow for so long I was just real boxed up, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I've been so I've been working on relaxing that shoulder. Uh, my peep actually moved up, mm -hmm. I believe it was up. One way or the other, it moved quite a bit on both bows mm -hmm. once since I've been messing with it, um, and just hoping to make the best shot yeah. I possibly can. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. Yes. Yeah. Well, overall, I know that we all three are in different places, both in our archery careers and in our setups. But it's interesting to see that we all have the same end goal. We want our animals to die quickly and with as little pain as possible, and honestly, so that we can recover them faster and feel good about what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's okay. One of the things that we see in this world is a lack of grace. We see a lot of people who are polarized and think, no, my way is better, no, this way is better, you're dumb for doing that. And I just don't think that that's where we need to be as hunters or where we need to be as uh, people who enjoy the same um, activities, right? The same pursuits. And so uh, I'm gonna do my best to learn from you and from from what you have experienced and see if instead of 
having to go through all that myself. And same for you, Tyler. Yeah. It would be great to be able to bounce more of these ideas off of one another. So if you have enjoyed this video, this discussion that we've had here, we'd also really appreciate for you to comment. We'd love to hear about your archery journey, maybe some of what your setups are and what you really like about it, or maybe what you might want to experiment with. If you have any other questions, put in the comments. We'd love to address that and have an open discourse about those things. And guys, I think it's time we get some sleep so we can go hunt action <laughs> sure. tomorrow. Yeah, that's right.